and a very warm welcome to all of you. I say, of course, very warm welcome, because I do not know exactly how strongly we feel the heat of hell uh, tonight, and I do not have specific expectations, and I do not know what your exact expectations will be for the night. But uh, by any case, we will talk about uh, Satanism. And as you might know, there have been fears and interesting discussions in theology alike and disciplines alike about what hell and devil and Satan actually is. And there have been ongoing discussions whether hell, for instance, is uh, endothermic or exothermic, yeah? whether the hell really absorbs heat or whether it gives heat, etc. Et I know one thing for sure, and that we will not have a thermodynamical approach this evening, but more a kind of historical, geographical and historical approach. And for that occasion, we invited a really well-established scholar in this field, and that is Mr. Massimo Introvigne. Uh, Massimo Introvigne is uh, uh, founder, I must say, and director of the Center for the Studies of New Religions in Italy. Uh, he has published an awful number of books on uh, small religious movements, on minority religions, on esoteric and Gnostic schools, and also about Satanism. And one of his major publications was a book in Italian, translated in Fren French, of 1997 on Satanism. We just had in 2010 a second elaborated edition, which was also translated in French. Uh, I said already that he has published on these movements in uh, an awful number of articles with, with I cannot present to you tonight. But he is also a director of the Observatory for Religious Liberty, uh, established by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Italy. He has been very politically active as well up till today, and uh, he's also a lawyer. He has a degree, a master in philosophy at the Gregoriana in Rome, and he has a master in law from the University of Turin. So what we will do tonight, that is first of all, I will give the floor to Massimo Introvigne, and then we will open the discussion with you. So there will be space enough, one hour, for questions, remarks, suggestions, or whatever from the audience, and we will kick off with a small talk, a small reaction by Ruben van Luyck, who just defended a PhD here, in the, here at the University of Tilburg, here in the Netherlands, with the title Satan Re Rehabilitated. He is working at this very moment on a publication that he hopes to publish in 2014, Children of Lucifer, a small history about uh, uh, Satanism, up to the year 2000. Actually, at this moment, uh, Ruben van Luyck is postdoc at the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology and Religious Studies here in Nijmegen in a project of the research program of culture, religion, memory, and he is postdoctoral researcher at the chair of the history of religion here in Nijmegen, held by Daniela Muller, who is also among the audience, I think, tonight. So again, a very warm welcome. I hope you will enjoy this evening. And I'm honored to give the floor to Massimo Introvigne. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here in this historical University of Nijmegen, which is particularly well known for its contribution to the history of theology. We call it Nimega in Italian. You will never recognize the, the, the name. And I want to start with a short story. Some years ago, while researching one of my books, I went to Paris and I wanted to meet with a group actually claiming that Satan was an extraterrestrial living in another planet. And it was not very easy to get to arrange a meeting with the leader of the group. And in the end, I still remember the place. It was called the Brasserie La Bouffard, a not very reputable beer house in a bad part of Paris. And finally, I met this guy, and I asked the usual question. And then came what is normally with this sort of groups, the tough question, how many members you have? And he answered, one billion. And I said, you mean one million? No, one billion. And I said, that's exceptional. And uh, 
Is there a place where I can see one of uh, your gatherings? And he said, not really, because we have only seven members on planet Earth. All the others uh, are in other planets. But you know, we are a large majority religion in other planets. But unfortunately, it's just seven on planet Earth, and we meet in this brasserie. So uh, why am I telling you this story? Because uh, uh, it's important uh, to start by explaining that we are not dealing with a massive uh, phenomenon. For instance, uh, I wrote a book about Pentecostals, half a billion people, that's Protestant Pentecostals, Jehovah's Witnesses, 16 millions, Mormons, almost 16 millions, organized uh, Satanists uh, are probably a couple of thousands in the world when there are not organized Satanists. So we are speaking about a tiny phenomenon. And at the end of this lecture, it will probably come out why, uh, nonetheless, this phenomenon may be interesting uh, for you. So what is Satanism? Of course, the definitions are not uh, essentialist. Definitions are just tools. And uh, among other things, what I teach in the university is sociology of religious movements. Uh, and uh, my definition is uh, one by a sociologist and perhaps for sociologists. And so I define uh, Satanism as a group uh, large or small, so that the guys in the brasserie are included, even if they are just seven, because they claim to be an organization. Uh, a group, large or small, gathered uh, in order to venerate, through rituals, the character known as Satan or Lucifer in the Jewish Christian uh, Bible. Now, the difference with other definitions, uh, like uh, the one uh, Ruben will probably present to you later, is that uh, I deal with groups. It may be small, but it should be a group. Now, does this mean that individual dealing with Satan, like artists, poets, musicians, are of no interest? Certainly not. They may be extremely interesting, and they may be influential, on a larger culture, including on uh, how that, uh, Satanist groups, but they are not part of Satanism as an organized social movement. It's also important to distinguish Satanism from other movements. Witchcraft, particularly in the modern incarnation known as Wicca, is not Satanism. They don't worship or venerate uh, Satan. Normally, they don't deeply care about Satan, regarding Satan as a Jewish Christian invention, while they want to go back to pre-Christian religious traditions. Not all sex magic is uh, Satanism. Uh, most Satanist groups use sexuality as a magical tool, but many other groups, Gnostic, for instance, uh, uh, or neognostic will use sexuality as a magical tool without having any veneration for Saturn. Anti-Christian groups are not Satanists. Some groups may be vehemently anti-Christian, and uh, that doesn't automatically make them uh, Satanists uh, if they do not worship Satan. But again, I want to insist on the fact uh, that uh, we take our definitions uh, uh, from a box of tools and uh, use them as it seems fit to us. So tonight, uh, I'm using this definition for the history of Satanism uh, as a social movement, uh, but it's perfectly legitimate that a theologian or a historian of art or a historian of literature will use a completely different definition. Having said this, what I propose to do with you tonight is twofold. Uh, first, uh, a history of modern Satanism, and second, a geography of modern Satanism. 
Uh, and for geography, I mean a cartography, uh, a map of what forms, shapes, groups, movements of Satanism do really exist in the world today. So the first part is about history. Modern Satanism has a beginning, and this beginning is dated 1680. What happened in 1680? In 1680, a group was discovered uh, which was accused of performing uh, satanic rituals at the court of Louis XIV, the famous uh, uh, Roi Soleil, the King of France. This group was allegedly, or according to the police, uh, uh, organized around two people, Catherine Lavoisin, who was an uh, abortionist uh, selling magical uh, filter for a living, and Etienne Gibourg, who was a marginal priest, but a real priest nonetheless. According again to the police uh, investigation, uh, of course there were many magicians or sorcerers uh, selling filters or doing enchantments in Paris in the 17th century, but Lavoisin invented something new. They actually claimed that it was possible to evoke Satan by organizing what she called the black mass, that is, to asking the client, who was usually female, to lay naked on an altar, and the priest will uh, say the mass on this lady who was the altar, and at the moment of the consecration, uh, Satan will be pleased and will actually invisibly appear and grant the wishes of the client. Now, the interesting part is uh, we don't know how much of this is true, uh, because uh, the trial uh, was a trial where uh, torture was used, but the rumors were quite persistent. So my personal opinion, if something was going on, uh, and uh, I call this proto-Satanism, because if you go back for a moment to my definition, you see that uh, uh, there is not a, a veneration of Satan per se. Uh, these people didn't really care about Satan. They didn't want to honor Satan. They didn't want even to criticize Christianity. They had no real quarrel with Christianity. What they wanted is to obtain some very practical achievements. Normally, the wishes of the ladies was to keep the love of somebody. Uh, allegedly, Madame de Montespan was involved, was actually the lover of the king. And what she wanted, she was getting old, was to keep the king against the competition of younger women. So it was very practical, commercial uh, Satanism. But perhaps more important than the actual event, was the fact that for the first time, these events became well known all around Europe. Of course, Lavoisin didn't invent all of the elements of the real or alleged black mass were present before in uh, uh, Satan worship trials, uh, accusations uh, of devil worship in convents, like in the famous case of 1634 of the devils of Loudun in France. So all the elements were there before, but here what we have is a semi-coherent whole, and what we have is the gazettes, the pamphlets. So the case of Lavoisin was known all over Europe, and the true or false that it was, we started having copycats. So after a few years in France, we have allegations of groups repeating what Lavoisin did in Versailles, and we have a number of incidents in other European countries as well during the next century, more or less trying to replicate what the pamphlets and the gazettes uh, had told uh, of what was going on in 1680 at the court of Louis XIV. There are 
cases, uh, we have some trouble in assessing exactly after so many years. Uh, in Reggio Emilia, Italy, there was a group of priests uh, allegedly doing black masses. They were not punished very seriously, and it seemed uh, they were very much interested uh, in uh, seeing and more than seeing naked women more than on anything else. Uh, in England, there was the very famous case of the Society of St. Francis, uh, which was established by the Councillor of the Exchequer, the Minister of Finances of the Kingdom, Sir Francis Dashwood. It's sometimes called the Hellfire Club, but this is a journalistic uh, nickname. They called themselves the Society of St. Francis. This has been studied recently through original documents, and it came out, it was a parody of the Black Mass, an anti-religious, uh, anti-Catholic parody by free thinkers. They wanted to mock Christians and particularly Catholics. In Russia, there were groups uh, uh, reading Paradise Lost by Milton, uh, determining that Satan in that poem was a very noble character and perhaps organizing rituals to honor Satan by reading Miltonic uh, verses. But that went on uh, for a little while, showing the force of the gazettes and pamphlets uh, which made the 68 episode uh, much more well known than previous incidents. Now, the scheme in my book, which has been mentioned before, which like all schemes runs the risk of being a little bit mechanic, is that I try to organize for the benefit of my classrooms the history of Satanism uh, as a pendulum process, where there is a period when there are some normally tiny, small Satanist groups, and the second period when, because of the existence of these very small groups, there is what sociologists call the moral panic. People became scared that there are a lot of Satanists around and use Satanism for interpreting much more complicated uh, phenomena. Normally, these anti-Satanism scares degenerate into ridiculous allegations, and because of their ridicule, they fail, which allows the Satanist groups, which are not created by the failure of the Satanist scales, they had existed uh, all around, but they went underground, and they can emerge again and not be persecuted too much. And then there will be another moral panic, and then the moral panic will become exaggerated and so on in history. As I say, it's a scheme largely uh, for organizing the study. If we take it too literally, the story rarely uh, follows schemes and it will really become mechanic. But it's true that because there were some tiny group of Satanists, uh, much large phenomena were interpreted with some reference to Satanism. And uh, the, particularly the Catholic world was up for two big shocks uh, between the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The first was the French Revolution, which was largely unpredicted and unpredictable. And so some people will say that's the work of Satan. And the second was uh, the, this new religion, which was really a big deal in the early 19th century, modern spiritualism or spiritism, uh, as they called it in France, people talking with the dead and receiving uh, from the dead the messages which were very often distinctly non-Christian. And this, again, was explained through the action of the devil. But we should distinguish, because at one level, uh, the influence of the devil on history, on the terror of the French Revolution, and even on spiritism, was a serious affair. There were very serious philosophers and theologians writing about it, like Goerres in Germany, or De Maistre uh, between Italy and France. And these are serious characters, 
we can't disagree with them, but they belong to the history of philosophy and theology. But then there were what in France were called the fou littéraire, uh, crazy people who uh, uh, gave a, a quite simple interpretation, saying the French Revolution was organized by satanic lodges where the devil appeared personally uh, and gave instructions uh, to the various Robespierre and Marat and uh, Napoleon. And even spiritism was not led by the figurehead, but there were secret chiefs who were uh, satanists personally in touch with the devil. Some of these characters were quite ridiculous, and some of these books uh, were really tall tales, so they fell into disrepute. And uh, uh, by the end uh, of, uh, by the last decades of the 19th century, nobody was taking them uh, uh, very seriously, which perhaps uh, allowed uh, some satanic groups to operate again uh, with, without being too much noticed. I say perhaps because I do agree uh, with Dr. van Loyck's uh, uh, argument that there is not certain evidence. Although even in my country in Italy, there were uh, at least police reports around the 1860s about possible uh, satanic groups, but uh, we all know that even the police, it's not infallible, and they may believe uh, uh, old wives' tales, as they say in England, we cannot uh, know for sure, and it was the same in, uh, in other countries. And uh, uh, these rumors coalesced in a very influential novel published in 1891, Labat, by the French novelist of some Belgian origins, Joris Carl Wiesman. And this is a novel who has the most detailed description of a black mass. It's a long description. And Wiesman allegedly took it uh, uh, from a number of sources, uh, and these sources were mostly three. Uh, it was the, the journalist uh, Jules Bois, a friend of him, uh, who was uh, investigating in small religious groups, but was not always very reliable. Uh, then uh, rumors he collected among the Belgian clergy, and then uh, uh, confessions of a friend uh, and perhaps a lover of him uh, called Bert Courrier. Particularly Bert Courrier, but also some Belgian priests, uh, told him the story of uh, how the chaplain of the shrine of the Holy Blood in Bruges, Belgium, Father Louis van Hecke, uh, was really a secret Satanist and the leader of a Satanist uh, coven. Uh, this is an extremely controversial issue. Even recently, Van Hecke has been studied. He, he was a very strange character. Somebody from Belgium would say typically Flemish, who even uh, liked uh, to spread tall tales about himself. So it's possible he contributed to rumors about himself. He was uh, a very strange guy, practical joker, perhaps really dabbling in some esoteric groups, but we have no way of knowing uh, how much is true about his involvement in Satanism, but anyway, Wiesman created a character called Le Chanoine d'Ocre, and de Ocre is Van Hecke translated into French. And so he created the, the, the modern canonized, so to speak, black mass, because uh, and, uh, after Wiesman, it became a case of nature imitating art and not vice versa, because to this very day, all Satanists, if they want to know how to do a black mass, they simply buy or download now the novel from Wisman. And you have a full ritual you could easily uh, enact. Now, uh, Wisman, one of the influences of Wisman was quite unpredicted by Wisman himself, because there was a new phenomenon around which called for a Satanic explanation. Not the French Revolution, that was old, 
spiritualism or spiritism was going down, emigrating to Latin America, but there was something which was of high concern, particularly to Catholics, Freemasonry. And so Freemasonry was powerful, was anti-Catholic, and they had to explain why it was successful. So uh, rumors started to circulate that in the Masonic lodges, uh, Satan was appearing and secretly leading Freemasonry. What happened in 1885 was that a minor Freemason and the author of a prolific author of anti-Catholic pornography, depicting the Pope, making love to nuns, and the other complicated stories, called Leo Taxil, in the night knocked at the door of a Jesuit home and asked to convert to Catholicism. He was quite a notorious character, so the Jesuits were quite surprised, but the church welcomed everybody, and so he was confessed, and he started writing books uh, against uh, Freemasonry for the Catholic audience. But for the first five, six years, he didn't write about Satan. Satan was hardly mentioned. Uh, what he wrote was that at a certain hour, at the end of the Masonic meeting in the lodges, the doors were opened and prostitutes entered, and it ended in a predictable way. So he was accused of simply making a com commercial miracle, recycling the pornographic stuff for the Catholic public, and since it was anti-Masonic, he could sell pornography to the Catholics, uh, and they believed they were actually buying very pious and Catholic books. But that will not be a very interesting story, except that in 1891, uh, as we mentioned, Labad, the novel by Wisman, was published, and then Taxil saw the light. He simply took the novel of Wisman and applied it to Freemasonry. He started saying that at the end of the meeting, the doors were opened, not for prostitutes, but for Satan himself, who would enter the Masonic lodges, appear, and run the show. And Taxil's main argument was that Freemasonry was just a facade, and there was a secret order called the Palladium who was manipulating Freemasonry. And uh, uh, then he, he told the story, Taxil wrote uh, more than uh, 15,000 pages during his conversion. So he told the story that there was a fight for who should be the high priestess of Palladium. And uh, finally, uh, somebody called uh, Diana Vaughan, an American, was elected high priestess. And uh, the story went on. And at one stage, Taxil announced that Diana Vaughan had converted to Catholicism. Not only this, Diana started to publish a magazine in Paris uh, with new revelations about satanic Freemasonry, Italian politics, French politics, American politics. Uh, and very pious poems in honor of the Virgin Mary and the miscellaneous Catholic saints. One problem is that nobody had seen Diana Vaughan, and so particularly the Jesuits, who are uh, reputed to be clever people, started having doubts uh, about Taxil. And uh, Taxil, although it was quite protected in Rome by the Pope who believed in his books, Taxil was under pressure to show Diana Vaughan to somebody. And in the end, in 1897, uh, Taxil uh, told his friends and the audience in general, OK, I'll show you Diana Vaughan. Just come, I think, yes, in April 19, 1897, to the room of Société de Géographie, and I'll show you Diana Vaughan, so you will all believe. But on April 19, uh, he didn't show any Diana Vaughan, but he simply announced, I never converted, I just played a very long, 12-year-long practical joke to Catholics to show you are extremely gullible. 
and then it went away and you can figure out the room erupted and it was quite tough for the police to keep the public order. Well, the Catholics learned their lesson because there was one thing Taxil didn't know, that while he was pronouncing his famous conference about how he infiltrated the Catholic Church, the general secretary of the Grand Orient, the largest Masonic French organization, was actually a Catholic infiltrate, who later published the secret documents of the Grand Orient, determining the downfall of the French government. So it's a bit of vaudeville, of a comedy where everybody was infiltrating everybody else, but for sure the Taxil incident gave a very bad reputation to anti-Satanism because tall tales about Satanism for many decades tended not to be believed because the media was just dismissed, all this stuff comes from Taxil, how can we believe this, which was perhaps unintended or unintended effect. So to make a long story short, when at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, some satanic groups started to appear, they were treated in a surprisingly sympathetic way by the media. And that was the case with a small uh, Luciferian or satanic uh, show uh, by a Polish woman called Maria de Naglowska, who later traveled to Rome, but started in Paris uh, organizing uh, satanic rituals, which perhaps were partially artistic shows, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Lucifer was a big part of uh, her uh, rituals. And again, for the sake of brevity, there were other incidents, but even in the United States, when uh, after World War II, uh, we saw some uh, satanic groups, the media say that's just uh, another American eccentricity. They were not very concerned, and that applied even to the Church of Satan, which was founded and incorporated in 1966, uh, uh, by a Californian adventurer, Anton Chandor LaVey, who later died in 1997, and by a still uh, living uh, uh, movie director, Kenneth Anger. Now, uh, we should mention at this stage uh, that all these good folks in the US were heavily influenced by a magician called Alistair Crowley, uh, who died in 47, was born in 1875. Crowley was not uh, a Satanist, uh, even if his rituals were extremely influential on Satanism, because uh, Crowley will be a very good case for a psychoanalyst, because he reacted very strongly to his father, who was very rich, left to him a lot of money, and he enjoyed this, but was also a staunch Christian fundamentalist. And so Crowley had this strong reaction and became an occultist, uh, became a sort of agent provocateur. He liked to call himself the beast 66th or the wickedest man in the world. Even the pronunciation of his name, uh, sometimes many people pronounce it Crowley, but uh, I remember well the pronunciation because I met uh, somebody who actually knew Crowley quite well. And he told me in order to remember how to pronounce the name, when he introduced himself, uh, Crowley was very upset when he was called Crowley or something similar. And so he introduced himself, say, hello, I'm Alistair Crowley, I double in everything unholy. And so you remember the, exactly the right pronunciation. But uh, Crowley, anyway, tried to create the perfect anti-Christian religion. And he criticized the Satanist, even if he wrote uh, a poem in honor of Satan, but it was merely symbolic and taken from Baudelaire, who wrote a similar symbolic poem, uh, because he said uh, my, in a letter, my friend, uh, the Satanist, uh, you have already lost, because by saying you are Satanist, you accept the truth of the Bible. So you have lost because you are small, the church is big, 
And so once you accept that there is some truth in the Bible, perhaps only the part about Satan, never mind, you have lost. So the real way of upsetting the Judeo-Christian civilization is to go back to pagan ideas, a cult of the sun, a cult of the sexual energy. Perhaps if you need symbols, take them from the ancient Egyptian tradition. But the only thing you should never do is to use the Christian language. So don't talk too much about Satan because that's Christian language. But uh, having said this, the rituals of Crowley were adapted very easily by uh, 20th century Satanists uh, with a link. And this link is a famous rocket scientist called Jack Parsons, who was an American follower of Crowley. Parsons uh, uh, was a crucial uh, crucially important rocket scientist in the history of rockets. A crater on the moon is named after him. He was one of the founders of Caltech. He finally died in the explosion of the Caltech laboratory, his own laboratory. And he's mostly remembered because he started a magic group where he called himself not Satan but the Antichrist and elaborated in the Crowley rituals. This group is very well known and studied today because one of the members was Ron Hubbard who went on to establish Scientology. And at one stage, the young Ron Hubbard escaped from the home of Parsons where he was living, taking away Parsons' money and Parsons' girlfriend. And uh, uh, the fantastic part is normally uh, Scientology would sue everybody who would tell uh, uh, tales who are not exactly complimentary about Ron Hubbard, but in this case, say, yes, we are very proud of this, because what Ron Hubbard did was basically to infiltrate and disrupt a satanic cult and save a young girl. So they say, he did it, and that was very good. Very good idea to take away their money because the group collapsed, and he also saved the girl by taking away the girl with himself. So what, he's a hero, he's a good man. Well, on this, of course, there are a lot of controversies, but what interests us tonight is that uh, the rituals of Crowley, as reinterpreted by Parsons, who started talking about the Antichrist, were adapted by Satanists, but we cannot say that either Crowley or Parsons are Satanists. And for a while, LaVey, with all his... Uh, typically Californian, bizarre uh, attitudes, uh, was quite popular with the media. But all uh, changed, uh, uh, however, uh, after a few uh, years in 1969. In 1969, we have the Charles Manson murders. Now, Charles Manson was originally not a Satanist uh, either. Uh, he was a drug dealer with some millenarian ideas about the Helter Skelter. Uh, he took the name from a song, and the Helter Skelter will be a racialist war between blacks and whites in America, which would have left a desolated wasteland, and the survivors would have taken to Manson for leadership. However, uh, uh, the, the media, particularly after he killed uh, Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski's wife, uh, started emphasizing uh, the satanic cult idea. And what happened is Manson himself in jail, uh, liked to call himself Satan and to play the satanic uh, card. For instance, he told everybody which no, uh, nobody knew, that one of the girls who actually killed Sharon Tate had been associated for a few months with the Church of Satan of uh, LaVey. And uh, in jail, he was visited and photographed quite liberally with Robert de Grimston Moore, an Englishman, who had established a very intellectual church with his wife, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which was a dialectic church honoring both God and Satan, Jehovah and Lucifer. Very cerebral church, which was studied by a sociologist I know quite well, Bill Bainbridge, 
who ended up even writing some of the rituals, as sociologists often do when they are too much into participant observation, and wrote a very successful book, uh, sociological book, Satan's Power, about this group which later collapsed. But anyway, the effect of uh, the Manson murders was catastrophic for Satanists because the media starting arguing that uh, Satanists was not an uh, unoffensive bunch of people. They were out for blood and murder, and they should be suppressed by the police. Now, the problem of the media campaigning against Satanism is that there were very few Satanists around, so they had to invent them. And uh, the way of inventing them was through hypnosis. People started under hypnosis to tell that when they were children, they had been abused by huge satanic cults of thousands of people, perhaps taking to a satanic temple, normally underground, and submitted to strong uh, sexual uh, rituals. This fashion was launched in 1980 by a Canadian Catholic uh, uh, psychiatrist, uh, Lawrence Patzder, who wrote a book called Michel Remembers uh, about uh, what uh, his patient, Michelle Smith, remembered under hypnosis. She remembered that she was abused in terrible ways by an international satanic cult actually led by her parents. In fact, the parents vehemently denied to have anything to do uh, with any satanic cult. And Patzder, for a while, was quite popular in Catholic milieu, was even received by the Pope, until he left the wife and started living with Michel. And uh, he fell out of fashion quickly uh, from the Catholic uh, uh, world. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Patzder started a fashion. There are more than 1,000 books uh, with similar stories of satanic cults discovered under hypnosis uh, in the 80s and early 90s. And then this fashion went out because there were thousands of cases which led to several hundred prosecutions particularly in the United States, but we had one in Italy, and there, are, there were some dozen in the United Kingdom. Prosecutors and the police looked for evidence, and uh, in the war there were more than 1,000 cases with only six convictions, and probably even in the cases of the six convictions, uh, uh, the accused were innocent, but that created a huge scare. For instance, huge amounts of money were spent in the United States to follow these recovered memories and look for satanic cults where the only evidence was obtained under hypnosis. And so the governments, the governments moved in the 90s. In the beginning of the 90s, both the American government and the UK government were ready to move and to commission official reports on the reality of recovered memories. Both reports were published in 94 in the US by the National Center of Child Abuse and uh, Neglect and uh, in the UK by a sociologist who has been commissioned to write the report. Uh, uh, Jean Lafontaine. Both reports concluded that uh, the material obtained through hypnosis was not reliable, that there were no international secret satanic cults uh, whose existence was discovered through hypnosis, and the stories were a figment of the imaginations either of the patients or of the therapists. And so the movement quickly collapsed, uh, although still in some countries there have been cases, uh, at least up to the year 2000, more or less, but uh, with the two official reports, the movement uh, collapsed. And anti-Satanism collapsed too. So once again, the media became very careful 
in reporting uh, about uh, Satanism, and one evidence is the almost sympathetic reports in the US uh, uh, for the 666 days in 2006, that's June 6, 2006, 666. And in this day, the Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, celebrated very publicly black masses, and the reports in the media were about a curiosity, not a satanic cult out for killing people. However, this may be short-lived again, because there have been uh, dramatic incidents, perhaps none more dramatic than the case of the beasts of Satan in Italy. That was a small group, never had more than 10 members. Uh, but in 2004, it was discovered that every year, uh, one of the members was a seer, a girl who claimed to be in touch with Satan. And every year, Satan directed her uh, to sacrifice, uh, killing, uh, uh, one of the members of the group. So uh, at least three homicides were attributed to the beasts of Satan with ample evidence, and they were sent to jail for life. So these incidents are rare, but the fact that they really happen may recreate uh, a satanic panic. And after the beasts of Satan, we have evidence something similar was going on in Italy. Quite quickly, <clears throat> I pass to the second part. What's going on exactly? And that's the geography, 2013. Are they Satanists uh, around? Well, I think we should divide our sheet of paper into four quarters and talk of four quite different phenomena. The first phenomenon is what I would call cultural Satanism, and that's the real thing. Uh, in the sense, uh, these are satanic religious movements, which in most cases are incorporated. They have bylaws. Uh, they may have uh, magazines. Uh, surely they have websites. They have uh, uh, a regular membership perhaps a publishing house, and uh, they have an established uh, ritual, and uh, they do belong uh, and conceive themselves as belonging to a long uh, satanic tradition. Now, this group of cultural satanists, uh, who are surely uh, groups counting less than 2,000 people in the world, probably less than 1,000, may be distinguished into two subgroups. I think I created this distinction uh, some uh, 33, yes, 33 years ago, calling them rationalist and occultist. Uh, rationalist Satanists correspond to the original modern of Anton LaVey. Now, LaVey didn't believe that Satan exists. So why was he celebrating uh, uh, black masses, uh, desecrating uh, hosts and crucifixes? For a very simple reason. LaVey told people uh, in a vague uh, uh, Nietzschean uh, uh, wording, but he took uh, his arguments uh, from an atheist uh, novelist, uh, very pro-capitalistic, called Ayn Rand. And LaVey say, the best things you can have in life are three things, sex, money, and power. Probably you don't have enough. And I discovered the secret why you don't have enough. Because even if you say you are an atheist, an occultist, you still are programmed by Judeo-Christianity. And Judeo-Christianity tells you uh, that having too much sex, too much money, too much power is bad. And that you should care for the poor, give some of the money uh, to the poor, which is completely wrong. So very, if, particularly if you are a Christian, there is only one way 
to do away with this programming, and two is to glamorously renounce Christianity by becoming a Satanist, saying your God is Satan, which is the God of uh, uh, money, power, and sex, uh, uh, profanating or desecrating Catholic or Christian symbols, uh, and that's a psychodrama. It's not real. Say, you don't believe in Satan, neither do I. Will tell, will tell his followers Lavey, but we need this psychodrama. Lavey was originally Jewish, was not uh, Christian, uh, but uh, we need this psychodrama to destroy this uh, inner programming which prevents us from enjoying uh, sex, power, and money. And so that's the rationalist uh, Satanism. And then we have the occultist Satanism because the second in the command of LaVey was a lieutenant colonel in the army of United States, Michael Aquino, who had a quite important position in psychological warfare operation. He was later dismissed by the army or counsel to step out honorably when he was just a bit too public as a Satanist, which didn't fare well with some circles in the army. And the Kino in 1975 said, you know what? It's not true. Uh, that's just uh, LaVey's attitude as a poseur, but in fact, Satan really exists. When I do these rituals, it's not only about renouncing Christianity. I see Satan, he talks to me. And it's not Satan, it's Set. It's an Egyptian god who had bad press with the Jews and so was uh, defam defamated as Satan, but it's really the god Set, who is a good god. And so uh, we had this schism in 1975. LaVey keeps the Church of Satan and Aquino establishes the Temple of Set. Remember, we are talking of a few hundred people not of uh, great uh, uh, religious groups. And uh, having uh, created uh, this distinction, or, or the names for this distinction many years ago, uh, and I'm pleased that my distinction is now repeated also by Satanists today. Say, I'm a rationalist Satanist, but uh, it's really Massimo Introvigno who created the label rationalist Satanist. Uh, and uh, I have to say that the distinction is not clear cut because in the end of his life, at least, we have letters by LaVey who believed a little bit in Satan himself. He's starting to talking about a strange manifestation, uh, psychic powers. Of course, with LaVey, you never know whether he's joking or he's talking for real, but the impression is believed a little bit. So he was a rationalist uh, with some occultist uh, trends himself. Now, the Church of Satan is still around. The Temple of Set is still very much around. Church of Satan is still around, but uh, as all religious organizations, after LaVey died in 97, it splinted into many subgroups. And perhaps more important, uh, the Church of Satan was uh, always a little bit, and more than a little bit, about making money. In order to get a card from the Church of Satan, you should pay a considerable sum. So now we have, particularly in Europe, people who say, we believe in LaVey's ideas, but we don't want to pay money to any organization. And uh, besides, there are many competing organizations. There is still the Church of Satan, who is under the leadership of one Peter Gilmore, uh, where is the first, uh, what's the name? I'm confused myself, the first satanic church under the leadership of Carla LaVey, LaVey's daughter, and then we have the first church of Satan under the leadership of Demon Egan, the modern church of Satan, and so on. So uh, it seems uh, that today the highest number, by highest number, I would say several hundred of followers of LaVey are in the Scandinavian countries, and they started by paying to the Church of Satan, and now they don't pay, so why should we? And so they simply claim to be followers of LaVey, but don't pay anything. So that's the uh, 
rationalist Satanism, and then this the occultist Satanism with Aquino's Temple of Set, uh, and uh, that includes some other groups around the world, including in Italy the Children of, uh, of Satan, which is a group, perhaps 100, 150 people, who won several court cases uh, and uh, won the right to exist in Italy, so to speak. Now, this is, in a way, uh, what is more similar to the story I told, the cultural Satanism. Then there is a second quarter, uh, and that's uh, the juvenile Satanism, and uh, it's made of groups, perhaps uh, there are in Holland too, uh, but surely there are uh, several hundred known to the police around the world at any given moment, <laughs> Groups of five, 10, 20, three, uh, juvenile, perhaps juvenile may be 25 year old, may be 15 year old, and they are also called the self-styled Satanist or acid Satanist because they use a lot of drugs, uh, and they congregate, they take their clues from music, uh, from comics, uh, sometimes uh, now they can download from the internet, and they organize homemade satanic rituals. Surely they, do, they may have a Facebook group perhaps, but they don't have website, they don't incorporate, they don't publish magazines, uh, and uh, normally they commit minor crimes, uh, such as sacrificing animals, which is illegal in most countries, uh, or uh, writing satanic slogans uh, on walls or churches, uh, uh, desecrating cemeteries. But there have been uh, five, perhaps six cases uh, in 30 years where they have actually killed people, like in the cases of the beasts of Satan in Italy, and so there is the possibility that some juvenile groups will act out uh, the metaphor of human sacrifice to Satan, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, in, uh, in cultural Satanism is mostly uh, understood as a metaphor. Uh, there is a third quarter, and the third quarter uh, surfaced in uh, 1989, when a drug dealer in uh, Mexico, uh, Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo, was shot by the police in Matamoros, Mexico, and it came out that he was uh, killing uh, people, he kidnapped, uh, allegedly uh, sacrificing them to Satan uh, in order uh, to be rewarded by Satan with favors uh, making his criminal activities uh, go on in a better way. Now, uh, this is not very new, of course. We can say it was not Satanism, it was Santeria or Brujeria. Uh, but in fact, uh, the police found references to Satan, which perhaps came from uh, the girlfriend of Constanzo, who is now in jail for life, who was an American college student called Sara Aldrete, Villarreal, who studied in Miami, and probably was exposed at least to what the media in the US were telling about Satanism. Latin American scholars have created a whole category uh, called narco-Satanism, and the truth about it uh, is that criminals uh, uh, even I have cases from Italian jails, uh, sometimes use satanic folklore, saying Satan can protect us from bullets, for, for instance. Uh, the fourth phenomenon, uh, there are some um, scholars which will talk about pedophile satanism. Uh, beware of it, because sometimes it comes from the recovered memory stories. But the only truth about it uh, is that there are cases of pedophile or minor abusers who, wo who will use Satan to scare the children, for, for instance, will dress as Satan, or will use in order to lure teenagers to sexual events, uh, 
the idea, let's do a black mass. And uh, there are cases, there is one in Italy, and of course that may work. In the case in Italy, there was a guy who called himself Reverend Ash, and they had a small booth in Pescara, central Italy, outside of the college, and he was asking the girls to come to satanic rituals, and some came and were drugged and raped by Reverend Dash. And of course, uh, it worked. He didn't really believe in Satan, but if he placed the boot outside of a college saying to the girls, let's come to my home, you will be raped, nobody would dare follow with him. <laughs> they say, let's come to my home and we will do a satanic rituals. Not many, but out of hundreds of girls, there were two or three who really followed him. Of course, it was caught by police quite easily, went just a little bit to public. So uh, pedo-satanism or pedophile satanism may be an imaginary category, but uh, some incidents do exist. So in conclusion, uh, why did we spend some time tonight talking about uh, a tiny phenomenon? I think uh, the story has a moral, and there is a reason why we did this, because uh, tiny as it is, this phenomenon generates a lot of media interest, movies, televisions, uh, press, comics, uh, songs, TV series. And why is this? Because the icon of Satan, as the present Pope Francis reminds to us, even this morning, is very much a part of our culture. And uh, perhaps uh, the way we treat Satan is a reflection of the way we reflect on ourselves. And in this way, Satan is a mirror, and when we look into Satan and into Satanism, what we see is really part, perhaps we would prefer not to see, of ourselves. And for this reason, I believe that Satanism will go on as a tiny phenomenon, that the interest on Satan will go on as a much larger phenomenon, and the years to come, scholars will still devote time to study Satanism, perhaps also because of the reason which is much more exciting, let's say, silent services of the Quakers, and that may be one of the reasons why so many scholars still write books about Satanism. Thank you. <laughs>